cops. What has so far been the creepiest call you've ever had to respond to and what happened? Got a call for a missing child. Got to the home to find the mother, highly distressed and not sure what to do. I called in everyone to first search the home and property. I decided to search the backyard since it was a large wooded lot with no visible fence. After about 10 minutes, I found the boy. He was caught on an old chain link fence in the woods that was blocked by a bunch of trees, so you couldn't see it from the house. He had basically gotten strangled to death on the fence. He must have been climbing on it, fell and got his hooded sweatshirt caught on it. The worst part for me was having to call it in on the radio knowing the mother might hear it inside from one of the other officers' radios. Story 2. Working third shift on Halloween night. I'm out by one of our smaller lakes just outside the city limits. Kids love to go out and drink, which is surrounded by some very nice houses. Going through the neighborhoods, each of the roads ends at a small two-lane road that surrounds the lake. I'm slowing to the stop sign and already starting to look to my right to make the turn. When my headlights start tracing the rock wall that surrounds the lake, I catch something out of the corner of my eye in one of the large trees that dots the walk path. I back up to see what it was, and I see a guy hanging. At first, I thought it was a Halloween decoration. The neighborhood is really into decorating for every holiday. So I stop, get out, and as soon as my flashlight hits it, I realize, nope, no decoration, he dead. As I'm standing there getting ready to call it in, I notice a gaggle of kids coming down the street trick-or-treating. Crap. As soon as they see my car, they start heading my way faster. So I book it back up the block to meet the parent walking with them, and I tell her she needs to take the long way around the block. She can see it on my face that I'm not kidding. Turns out he was a 20-year-old that was devastated about his girlfriend breaking up with him, and she lived in the last house on that block where she would have seen him the next morning when she looked out her window. Story 3. We respond to a burglary alarm at a mortuary, and found that one of the rear doors was left open. Policy now dictates that the entire building needs to be cleared, searched, to confirm that it was a false alarm, which most are. It's the middle of the night and totally dark. We use flashlights and never turn on lights. We walk into one of the rooms and see a body on the table. It appeared that it was waiting to be processed, possibly embalmed by the mortician. It smelled like a mildly decomposing body. Suddenly, I see a shadow to my right and I shine my light there and find nothing out of the ordinary. I immediately smell a really strong whiff of perfume blow by me. The search was completed more expeditiously than normal after that. Nothing was found. Story 4. It was a stormy night on the Oregon coast. A lady was driving drunk and ran into the back of a parked school bus. When she did, her car caught on fire, but she was able to escape. When I found her slowly walking down a side street, I was telling her to stop and turn around. When she turned around, her lower jaw was gone and she was totally dazed. Her tongue was sticking straight out the top of her neck and she was trying to talk. She ended up surviving but needed tons of plastic surgery. It's absolutely insane the kinds of things that humans can just walk off. This sounds like one of the most horrific injuries I've ever heard. But not only did she walk it off, she survived. That's incredible. Story 5. I responded to a report of an unresponsive infant. When I arrived, all the family members were standing around casually in the front yard pointing into the house. I found the baby in the back room laying on her back on a bare mattress. I started CPR but realized that the baby was probably already deceased. We rushed her out to the arriving ambulance hoping they had a way to bring her back. I learned she was the mother's second suspicious SIDS death, and I had her other children removed from her care. The difficult part was when I left the scene and went to the ER to see what came of the situation. As I walked in and asked where she was, an ER nurse walked over to me and handed me the deceased baby swaddled in a blanket, and told me to wait for someone to show me to the morgue. So I'm standing there in the ER in uniform holding what everyone thinks is a live infant, but is instead an infant corpse and several people stop by wanting to see her and commenting on how cute it is to see an officer holding a baby. I just smiled, but it tore me up inside. I was ushered back to the morgue after what felt like an eternity, and I was told I had to wait with the baby until the medical examiner arrived. They took the blankets off and laid her on a stainless steel gurney and left me alone with her again. I lounged around the morgue for about an hour waiting. By the time I got home, several hours after the end of my shift, because this call came out 15 minutes before the end of my day, I lay down on my bed and cried for a long time. My young daughter was in daycare, and my wife was at work. I really needed to just hold both of them, but the house felt so incredibly empty. My daughter was only slightly older than the infant, and when I was looking at her earlier, I kept seeing my own daughter. I didn't get any sleep at all before going back in on the next shift. That seems very cruel from everyone to make you hold that baby. You are not trained for that kind of stuff. Although admittedly it is probably the correct protocol, but I don't know. I trust these kind of professionals do things right, but at the same time it just seems so wild to me that this poor officer would just have to hold a deceased baby. Ugh. 
Yeah, it's, it's creepy. It's weird. Story 6. Got a call that someone wasn't answering their phone or the doorbell. We got to the house and noticed that every window was blinded by either curtains or pieces of paper. We rang the doorbell and yelled through the letterbox, but there was no answer. We opened the door and got inside. In the house, it looked like someone just had lunch. There was bread on the table and juice or milk in the glasses. Children's toys scattered all around. Then I saw a note that gave me the chills. It was the kind of note you would expect. As the door was locked from the inside, the person had to be in the house. We checked room by room, and my heartbeat was at 300% when I checked the bathroom. Preparing myself for slit wrists or throats, I opened the door slowly. But there was nothing. Finally, one more room left, which was the attic. We walked slowly up the stairs, and we found the resident there, hanging from a beam. I will never forget the adrenaline I had. Or the scene in the living room or the resident I found. Story 7. I was a resident director at a student dorm, and we would get calls from helicopter moms that hadn't heard from their child in three days, so I would occasionally have to do wellness checks. I was never really concerned because kids are too busy getting stoned, shagging, studying, and drinking to call mom every night, but I had one call that I was prepared to see something ugly. It was for a resident I knew pretty well who was always a bit down, who didn't really have any friends, and gave off a weird vibe. But I knew she was close to her parents and walked around calling them a lot. Keying into her room, I was ready to see her in a tub or with a belt around her neck or a pill bottle spilled somewhere. Nope. She was shacked in with a new bang buddy and they'd turned the dorm into one large fort complete with rooms and video game lounge and she'd been too busy shagging and smoking dope to call mom. She hadn't heard me knocking over there, noise making, and both were quite upset I barged in. That was a good day. I can't think of a lot of situations where a resident director would be happy walking in on two people banging, but this is definitely one of them. It's kind of heartwarming that this person found a connection, obviously, and that they're still alive, even more obviously. I can only imagine how nerve-wracking that must have been. Story 8. Not a cop myself, but my dad is. And I asked him this one time. He told me it was when he went to this one house because a woman had called and said that men were breaking in. He gets there and he said it was immediately very clear that the woman was not exactly altogether mentally. He said she kept mumbling things and was very jumpy and skittish, not to mention that every single wall of her house apparently had at least six or seven crosses on them, if not more. He calms her down, checks around the house for any sign of entry or just anything weird, and there's absolutely nothing that would indicate that anyone had been trying to or had been successfully breaking in. He said she followed him around the entire time and would point to things like a doorknob or window latches and say, Oh, that's not where I left it, that's how they got in. He said the whole thing was fairly eerie considering how he was at this woman's house in the middle of the night, surrounded by crosses and listening to her mumble on about random crap. To make her feel better, he did a sweep of the whole house to see if there was anyone else in sight. Which, of course, there wasn't. He said the one thing that made it creepy for him was the fact that every few minutes, she would say something like, Oh, they're here again. Or, He's right behind us. I can feel it. Paranoid people mixed with zealous, religious, I don't know, representation, I guess, like on the walls and stuff. Yeah, that's freaky. That's like horror movie stuff. I bet there was something in the back of that cop's mind that was like, you know, maybe she's onto something. Maybe there is someone here. And that probably scared him at least a little. Story 9. Ex-cop. I worked in a high-tech task force agency conducting computer forensics investigations. Lots of indecent children stuff. Anyway, we were doing a multi-agency search warrant sweep in a large metro area in California. We serve a search warrant for distributing slash possessing child content at a residence in a semi-decent area, and the suspect fit the prototypical Hollywood child toucher look. He lived with his disabled wife, no kids, and she had mobility issues. Mostly stayed downstairs and had not been upstairs for years. We go upstairs and this guy has a legitimate, like, jerk station set up in one of the bedrooms that had an outside padlock on it. It was dark, the windows were covered, and he had baby dolls with their buttholes cut out all over the room. And some of their mouths cut out for impromptu baby bang doll. Some of the heads were removed and scattered on the floor. This guy had serious issues. This kind of creepy really gets me actually because these are like things people do behind closed doors and they seem so normal outwardly presenting although this guy said he seems kind of typical but still. They could be just walking next to you and then in their house have this. That's horrifying. Story 10. UK. Got called to assist ambulance at an address because they were struggling with a woman who'd had an apparent seizure. 
We got there and she's this tiny, skinny little Singaporean lady who's being held down on the floor by a paramedic. She's hissing and struggling and repeatedly trying to bite the paramedic. Her eyes are all black and red, no white. It takes me, 200 pounds, my partner for the evening, 180 pounds, plus three paramedics to hold her down. All the while, she's struggling and trying to bite with veins popping out of her neck. She's looking past us at the corner of the room, screaming at something that isn't there, telling it not to unalive her and us. Her husband, who seems weirdly unfazed by the whole thing, tells us this has been happening since she last went to Singapore and got sick after visiting a holy site. Usually, her sister has to stop it by putting this powder on her forehead and a cross, but unfortunately, she's out of the country. In the end, she was taken to hospital for a mental health assessment by the paramedics. I often wonder what the outcome was, but have no way of finding out, unfortunately. If I had to give a wild guess, I would guess the mental health assessment did not turn up negative. This sounds either like some really powerful substance abuse, because like the whole changing eye color thing, I don't know if that can happen with just psychosis. But there's definitely some of that involved regardless. Yeah, that would be freaky. Also, isn't it crazy how strong these small people get when they're freaking out? Adrenaline is one hell of a drug. Story 11. For some reason, the self unalives always hit me the hardest. I had a good friend who committed in high school, so it's a touchy subject. Not just for everyone, but especially for those who have personal experience with it. I've seen three by gun, two hangings, and a handful that did it intentionally by using drugs of some sort or other methods. Long story short, Guy shot himself in his garage with a 357 Magnum. I have a pretty strong stomach, thankfully because of experience, but I believe I accidentally stepped on a piece of his eye. When I cleared the call, I went straight to the locker room and cleaned the bottom of my boots for a good 40 minutes. I repeated the cleaning process at home, too. Now sure, that's not exactly creepy, just disturbing, but hey, here's one. We get a call from the hotel off the interstate. Employees went to clean a room and found a note on the bathroom door, which was closed and locked. It read, Don't come in. Call 911. So the front desk did just that. We get there and she shows us the room. We try knocking on the bathroom door, no answer. We weren't even sure if there was someone in there or not. The on-site manager told us we were allowed to force entry into the bathroom. She was concerned because none of the employees ever remember the guests checking out. My partner gets the door open and it was like something out of a horror movie. Guy was in the tub, completely naked, knife on the floor just next to the tub. Cuts on his wrist and the absolute worst thing was the blood inside of the tub. I have never seen so much blood in my 10 plus year career. His face was pale white and it appeared as if he was frowning. He was not breathing. Call a medic, my partner says. I just look at him and say, uh, no. Dude's dead. I'm not touching him. You can check if you want, but we need to get our supervisor, an EVT, and a detective here. I could recognize a dead guy when I saw one. I get the manager, who is having a legit panic attack, to calm down and head back to the desk while we deal with this. Called for another car and told dispatch to contact our evidence technicians and a detective. When I hear my partner scream and exclaim, Oh, friggin' crap! I run back over there and he's wide-eyed staring at the body. He, he just moved. That fricker's alive, man. He moved. What are you talking about? He has a frickin' pulse. It's faint as hell, but he has it. His leg moved under the water when I tried checking for it. Sure enough, I put on my big boy undies and could barely feel a pulse on this guy. Medic called and they rushed him to the ER. Turned out he did the cutting just minutes before the cleaning maid found the note, so surprisingly, he barely lived. Editing for clarity. He lived, but it wasn't pretty. He cut his wrists while he was bathing, and a majority of what looked like blood was indeed blood. But it was mixed in with water, which made it look like there was a lot more blood than what he actually spilled. And I know, I should have been more proactive in checking for signs of life. It was irresponsible of me to not check sooner. In many instances, it's fairly easy to spot a corpse when you have one, but this one really tricked us. And we learned from that. Thankfully, my partner did while I stepped out, and I was not intending to stop him from doing so. My tone was a bit more cynical. Eh, dude looks dead. I really don't think we need a medic. You can check him, but I don't want to. And in our defense, he really did appear to be 100% dead. No chest movement at all. Pale skin. It looked like he could have been there for at least hours. But like I said, I was wrong and I acknowledge that. Sometimes you forget that your experience and training isn't objective. And still being relatively new then, it was a learning experience for me. You can bet that from there on, we were both a bit more cautious. OP keeps saying we. Like, this one really tricked us, and we were both more cautious. Like, come on man, you gotta admit, it was on you. And that's fine. You don't need to throw your partner under the bus. Your partner followed procedure and you did not. A mistake and it happens, but come on. Seriously though, that's really brutal to find. And given the scene, I would understand why you thought he may be dead. And as a final note for this story, I just want anyone who is thinking of doing anything similar for any reason to know that you are valued.
If you need to, I encourage going out and seeking help. There are hotlines, a therapist if you can manage to get one. Taking your own life just isn't the answer, even if everything feels hopeless at the moment. I promise. I love you all, stay safe, and uh, next story. Story 12. Got a report of a missing husband. He told his wife and family of six children that he was going to get his tires changed but never returned, and this was 12 hours ago. They had purchased another house in a neighboring community, and the relationship with the wife was under pressure, so the wife assumed that he was staying at the other house and claimed he would never unalive himself. The strange thing about this report, though, was that he emptied his personal bank account into his wife's this morning as well. The wife explained this by saying that they recently had a fight about finances, and he agreed that he was bad at money and maybe they should have a joint account that she would control. On a hunch, I asked his 14-year-old boy if there were any areas in the mountains nearby that his father enjoyed going to, and the son identified a road about 10 miles away. It was nearing midnight, but I decided to drive up to the top of this old and abandoned forest service road. As I drove through the snow and started to climb up the road, I had a gut feeling that I would 100% find this guy up there, either thinking about or already acted out on aliving himself. The snow-laid gravel road had some sign of travel, but no real indication of how fresh the vehicle traveled could be. As I reached the top of the road after an hour of travel, I was honestly surprised that I did not find his black truck. I spent the drive back down thinking about gut feelings and how they are unreliable, but that I somehow felt different about this one. As I traveled up the road, I did notice over a dozen smaller roads branching off, but they were not mapped, and I had already spent too much time on a single occurrence in a busy city with too few police officers. Nonetheless, I decided to check a single one of these secondary roads, and about three quarters of the way down, I picked a road at random to check, and sure enough, my headlights lit up the back end of a black truck about a hundred yards past the first corner. Even if I hadn't memorized the license plate beforehand, I wouldn't have had to run it. It was clearly his. I radioed that I had found the truck, parked my vehicle, and traveled the twenty feet to his truck, with my heart beating like I was doing a sprint rather than a normal walk. What I found inside was a mess of brains and blood caused by a self-inflicted shotgun wound under the chin. I'll save you from the description. There was just something about the gut feeling while traveling this abandoned and quiet mountain road, followed by a sense of being tricked by the gut feeling, then finding out it was true by discovering such a gruesome scene, having to wait three hours next to his truck waiting for the body removal, and then to end it all by having to go to the family who is expecting good news to deliver them the worst news possible. That makes me feel creeped out to this day. Hey everyone, I just wanted to pop in at the end of this video to say thanks so much for watching. This was a much heavier one than usual, so thanks for sticking through it first of all, and if you had to click off or skip to the end, is no worries at all, I promise. Give yourself a treat now. Go do something you really like, or go talk to someone you really like, or I don't know, just just find something to do. Something upbeat and cheery. Unless you're in a, a dark, gloomy kind of mood, then I don't know. Move on to the next one of these, I guess. But really, thanks so much for watching, take care of yourselves, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.